Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest Oxplore Big Question live stream, uh, where today we will be discussing the question, could there be real life X-Men? Uh, I will be your host for the next 45 minutes. Uh, I am Dr. Tom Crawford. I am a mathematician uh, at the University of Oxford. I also do lots of things on YouTube uh, with my own channel, Tom Rocks Maths, and also with Numberphile. Uh, this is our first event using this new uh, format on, on Teams. So I do have a few bits of admin just to get out of the way so we can all have a nice time and have a really enjoyable uh, discussion around the question. Uh, so first of all, um, please make sure your video and audio are turned off uh, throughout the event. The uh, entire uh, event will be recorded uh, and then this will go on YouTube so you can watch it back afterwards, which will hopefully be fun. Um, we will also be, uh, our panel in fact, will be referencing the activity packs uh, throughout the, um, the discussion. Um, if you've done these, great and I'm sure they will be very useful, but don't worry at all if you haven't. It's not essential to have done these. Uh, so if you hear the word activity pack and start to panic, don't worry, you will still be able to follow everything that is being discussed. Um, so the things we have for you today, we made this extremely uh, interactive uh, event as much as we can in the current situation. Uh, so we've got brain training uh, for you coming later. We have a quiz. Uh, on superhero animals, which I'm personally really looking forward to. I don't actually know the answers yet. Uh, and we even have a very special guest in the form of a real life spider. Um, so stay tuned for that one. Uh, as always with these events, we want you to get involved. So please do send in your questions um, to the panel using the chat. So just if you have any comments or any questions you want to put to our experts, write them in the chat and then they will be passed to me and then I will read out some of those questions and put them to our expert uh, panel. There will be a prize for the most thought provoking question. Uh, so not only do you get to an answer to your question, you also win prizes. This is, this is really, really a fantastic event. Um, the, the winner of that prize will be announced on social media probably tomorrow or within the next uh, few days. So it's probably about time we met uh, our panel who've been sitting patiently waiting. Uh, so to kick us off, we have Beth. Beth, would you like to uh, introduce yourself to our audience? Hello, I'm Dr. Beth Mortimer. I'm a biologist and spider enthusiast. I work at the Department of Zoology at the University of Oxford. And uh, yeah, I work on spiders. It's especially spider senses and how they use vibrations, which we'll find out more about uh, during this demonstration. I like how you said spider senses, because I'm immediately picturing Spider-Man saying, my spidey senses are tingling. Um, but I'm sure, I won't, I mean, we won't go into that just yet. I'm sure we, you can tell us more about uh, exactly what you mean uh, when we come to your demonstration with the, with the spider um, later. Thank you very much. Uh, Beth. So yeah, we've got a lot of, all oh, right. Okay, it's gone. I think somebody remember to mute, mute your <laughs> microphones, everybody. <laughs> so I, um, I am Dr. Juan Manuel Galeazzi Gonzalez. It's a very long name. So if you just call me Juan, it's fine. And I'm just here in the University of Oxford. And I'm trying to figure out how the brain works. Um, and I think that's it. Yeah, we'll, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about that. Perfect. So figuring out how the brain works. That sounds tricky, I'll be honest. <laughs> uh, so, um, so anything to do with the brain, neuroscience, uh, et cetera, that would be uh, perfect for one to, to get stuck into. Uh, and then our third and final member of the panel uh, is Tess. Tess, you want to say hello? Yes, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Tess Johnson. I am studying a PhD or DPhil at the University of Oxford in philosophy. Um, so my work specifically looks at uh, human enhancement. So it's very X-Men related, but I don't look so much at how we can do these things, um, but more whether or not we should actually be trying to do them at all. So all of the shoulds, um, send, them, send them my way. Um, and I was thinking about this question earlier. I was thinking that um, what superpowers would I want if I could be an X-Men? And I think I've got to say, uh, mind reading would uh, just blows everything else out of the water. So, just a little <laughs> I'm with you on that. I'm, yeah, yeah, no, I think, I think, what is it? Is it Professor 
versus is that Xavier Professor X, the leader of the X Men, right? He's the like mind reading. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That is that is a very good one. Um, awesome. Thank you very much, uh, Tess, and thank you to all of our, our panel. So now you've got a little bit of a feel of um, of what our panel work in, then hopefully that's starting to give you some ideas or questions that, that they might uh, love to answer. Um, so now we've got some demonstrations, as promised. Now we've met the panel. Uh, each, each member of the panel does have a, a sort of short demonstration and a little bit of a discussion based around our big question, can there be real life X-Men? So I believe, Beth, you're going to kick us off with our superstar guest. That's right. Well, the guest will be arriving shortly. Um, okay. So just to put a little bit of context over what I do. So I, I study animals, uh, but I'm interested in how nature has come up with solutions uh, to various problems that are faced by animals. So I'm particularly interested in developing new technologies that are inspired by animals. So if we take spiders as an example, spiders are very good at using materials that they make themselves uh, to make a web, which is obviously used to capture prey. Now, they use this out of uh, normal kind of protein materials. So they basically turn flies into a very, very strong material. So if we study how nature is able to uh, generate these solutions, for example, for materials or for um, sensing as well, which we'll come to, then you can make uh, efficient uh, technologies that we can use to uh, enhance ourselves via using technology as tools. So what I'm going to try and do now is um, share a video. This video should be uh, very familiar uh, in terms of the context. So if I share my screen. And this video is going to play a few times. So hopefully Tom will nod that he can see the video. Yeah, good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have a bumblebee here that is hitting a spider's web. So a lot of you will be familiar with this type of web. It's called an orb web uh, because basically it's got these spokes of silk threads that meet in the middle like the spokes of a bicycle. So what I want you to do is you're um, looking at this video is in the chat feature within Teams. Can you please put down some words that you associate with this video? So adjectives or descriptive words for how you might describe what the web is doing. Uh, so please take a few seconds then uh, to put some suggestions into the chat feature. Can I, can I just add that I find it mildly terrifying for the poor bee that's being trapped knowing what is coming next. <laughs> I don't know if that counts as, as, a, as a descriptive word, but... <laughs> well, you <laughs> might notice okay in, in that particular video, the spider wasn't there, so that the bee was okay. Okay, phew. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we've got lots and lots of different things coming through. I'm... Bouncy. Going to pick out a few. Um, keep them coming for another few seconds or so. This is great stuff, guys. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm going to skip over the kind of death and trapped theme and go for more. Okay, so we've got sticky, uh, restrictive. We've got um, strength. Um, so these are some... Um, <laughs> So we've got lo lots of words that we can talk through. Okay, uh, you, you can start with the suggestions now, thank you. So um, at this point then, I'm going to show you our little friend. So hopefully it worked out best if I kind of position her right in front of my face. So this is a spider that you would find in the gardens at the moment. So uh, she is a garden orb weaver spider and in fact i picked this spider out from my garden uh, this morning so there's lots of big females around at the moment so what i want you to be able to appreciate if i turn her around so most people know about spiders obviously eight legs but what they've also got right at this end of their abdomen uh, they've got what's called the spinnerets and the spinnerets make silk. 
So you might have heard of silk in terms of uh, textiles and clothes, uh, but spiders make silk to uh, make their web. So thinking back to that video, uh, people came up with words like strong. So absolutely, what this material is able to do is it doesn't break when the fly, when the bee hits the web, and it's able to stop the bee so that the spider can catch it. So that's absolutely the first property of this spider web, this silk, is that it has this strength. And in fact, if you scaled up a spider web so that each one of the threads was the diameter of your little finger, so going up from very small to the diameter of your finger, it could absorb the same amount of energy as a Boeing 747 at full speed. So these are amazing materials in terms of their strength, and they achieve this because they're so small. And for the spider, it, they have to use the minimum amount of material and get the maximum amount of benefit out of it. So the second kind of group of words that you came out with uh, was kind of sticky and kind of retaining or having the, the be hostage within the web. So that's actually a different type of silk, which was going round the web. That is the sticky capture spiral. And the job of that is to retain the bee long enough so that the spider can get to it. So lastly, um, what I'm particularly interested in in terms of spider sensing is the ability of the web to actually transmit vibrations. So the spider knows that the bee is in there because it can feel the movement of the web. Uh, and that's what my research particularly uh, looks at. So thinking about how this ties in with our question then, what I'm, what our research is interested in looking at is, can we learn from how spiders make these strong materials that are very thin out of protein materials, so natural materials? Can we make energy efficient materials that can be used to replace plastics, for example? But also from the sensing side of things, can we make, uh, can we use similar types of sensors that spiders use? So just to finish off uh, with one uh, thought from our uh, spider here. So the main sense for this spider is their ability to feel vibrations. And they actually have over a thousand ears effectively spread out on their legs. So they're extremely sensitive to small movements. Um, so I look forward to receiving uh, questions to do with spiders specifically, but also uh, anything to do with animals, I'd be happy to chat through. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Beth. And I, I genuinely never knew a spider had even one ear, never mind a thousand. So that is absolutely my fun fact of the day so far. So thank you very much uh, for sharing that with us. Um, right. So next in line, we have one. Juan, would you like to um, show us your demonstration, please? Yes, of course. Uh, so before we actually start the activity, I would like to just share some slides with you related to this topic. So let me know if you can you can see the presentation. Maybe Tom, yep. can you? All yep. good. Thumbs up. OK, great. So um, yeah, like I said, so before we begin the activity, I would just like to say a couple of things regarding the, the big question on whether there could be real life X-Men. And uh, as you might remember, uh, I work as a neuroscientist, so I try to uh, figure out how our brains, our brains work. And they, they can do very remarkable things. So actually, I will try to make the case that maybe we already are sort of, you know, superhero X-Men. Um, and if you think about it, uh, humans, and, and not only humans, but spiders, like, like uh, Beth was talking about, we are the product of thousands of years of genetic variations and mutations. And it is through evolution by natural selection that we are now capable of displaying amazing behavioral and, and cognitive abilities that we often take for granted because we don't think they are that impressive just because, you know, all humans can do that. It's like, you know, all spiders might not think that it's impressive to do a spider web because, a spider web because they can all do that. But if you're not a spider, you think that that's remarkable. Um, so for 30 age, we're capable of using our bodies to display amazing behavioral abilities uh, so we can we can adjust and modify our behaviors to to achieve a wide range of goals um, but I mean obviously I'm showing you footage of quite impressive things that kids can do from a very early age 
but even everyday activities uh, can actually uh, show a, a, qu a quite complex uh, uh, type of, of behaviors. And you know, I'm, I'm also working, uh, I'm trying to figure out how the brain works because I'm also interested in artificial intelligence. So same as uh, the Beth, uh, the approach that Beth was talking about, so how, how they are interested in, in looking at nature and how nature develops certain things to, to then create technology. We're also interested in how, uh, how is it that we can create more intelligent machines, right? Uh, so in recent years, when you see perhaps computers or, or robots that are outperforming humans, especially on things that we, we think that are very difficult to do, like you know, playing chess or, or playing Go, we, we might tend to feel that maybe we're not that smart if machines uh, can beat us at that. But um, actually, uh, there, there's an anecdote. Um, uh, there's a, there was a roboticist called Hans Morabek. And Hans Morabek uh, worked for many years developing uh, robots. And he realized that uh, paradoxically, some of the simplest things that we perform every day, like, I don't know, lifting a cup, uh, going up and down stairs, uh, kicking a ball, uh, yeah, playing football are actually quite, quite difficult to, to implement them in a robotic platform. So we don't have uh, good robots for these activities. And, and, and just to illustrate this point, I'm going to show you a footage from one of the top robotic competitions not that long ago. And basically the robots, all they needed to do was to go through an obstacle course. And they had to do very, very simple things like opening a door and entering a room and taking something out of that room, which is something that is trivial for us because we do it every day. But you know, some of the things that we think are the simplest and more trivial, because just because we don't have, we don't, we do it effortlessly, are actually very difficult to do. Are very difficult problems to solve, and we do that without any effort. So that is impressive. We don't get it too impressed because we just do it every day, and everyone can do that. So nobody's going to think that it's impressive that you <laughs> go up the stairs. But actually, when you actually want to make a robot that, that that does that efficiently, you realize it's a really hard problem, and we solve these problems every day. Um, so yes, so maybe I, I, I started to, by trying to convince you that, that we are amazing and maybe we already have superpowers, but I mean, we also have some limitations and it's, that's also part of my research to try to figure out, you know, there are things that we evolved to be good at, but there are also things that we're, our brains are not particularly well suited for. And, and now this is basically, we're going to show this through a, a, a quick example, a quick demonstration. So I hope, I hope this runs properly, but if you cannot uh, see it, we, we, we have another option on how to do it. But uh, basically, what I'm going to show you a clip, and, and this clip is going gonna, is gonna to have some flickering images. And at some point, something in that image is going to change. So uh, I'll, I'll let it run for a few seconds, and then after I stop it, then I'll see if anyone could spot what changed in that, in that video. All right, so this is the picture. And let's just give it a bit. And then it's going to be flickering. I feel like I'm playing spot the difference. <laughs> it is. It is a little bit like that. So I'm, I'm just going to open the comments now just to see if people were able to figure out where the changes are. Let me see if I can see them. Um, exactly. So we had one person spotting it. All right. Yes. Yes, actually. Yeah, a lot of... I, 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 didn't, I absolutely did not see that. <laughs> so very, very well done, exactly. everybody else. So the engine disappeared, right? So if you all pay attention to the engine, it's very, very obvious. You know, it goes away. Right? So there's the engine and it goes away. But, uh, you know, obviously we, we do it in a proper setting and uh, obviously here is displayed a big screen, but, you know, it's actually not that easy to spot sometimes. And there are tons of examples of this. So I'm, I'm going to show you another one and then, and then see if you can figure out what changes here. Um, well, is this, this is slightly different. This is uh, you basically have to count the passes of the white. How many passes? Okay, so some people actually spotted some, some, something interesting that went on in the video. So I'm just going to play it again to see. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to play it again. I'm going to play the last part. <laughs> uh, 
So basically, there, there was a moonwalking bear. Some of you spotted it, and that's great. But sometimes if you do this experiment with people, like almost half the people missed the fact that there was a, a man dressed with a costume of a bear moonwalking through the entire image. So uh, there are tons of examples. And, and, and you know, like, I, I, in the Word document, we called it brain teasers, but each, each experiment has a, has a particular name to you know, show us how we have sometimes some attentional limitations, uh, some memory limitations. If we're focusing attentional resources to one particular spot, we might miss something else that goes on around. So basically, I'll just conclude by saying that, yes, we, we might all be you know, X-Men already or have amazing powers. We just don't notice it because we all have them. But at the same time, like all superheroes, we also have some limitations that we need to you know, bear in mind and take into account. So that, yeah, that would be... That would be it. So I'll. That that was fantastic. The uh, I, I again I I did not spot the bear the first time and then the second time once you like similar to the picture once you point it out you you then spot it don't you it, it's almost like how did I miss that <laughs> the, the first time so I think that was a great example. Um, right, so that just leaves us with our third and final panel member. So Tess, over to you to discuss ethics. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, that was, yeah, I'm really enjoying myself so far. It seems like all of these um, activities have been running really well. And my activity for today, for those of you who have had the chance to take a look at it, we're doing some philosophical thought experiments. We're having a think about what we would do if we were in certain situations where we could actually have X-Men for our own children. So no matter for those of you who didn't get through the activity pack, what I'm going to do at the moment is just present to you this thought experiment. I want you to put yourself in this situation um, and have a think about how you would react. But before we get on to the actual question itself, I just want to talk to you a little bit about what might be a way that we could have um, X-Men in the future. Uh, and obviously, there are ways that we've already discussed in terms of, you know, maybe we can, um, maybe there are ways that we could create environments where we can sense vibrations better, or maybe we could have better attentional awareness to our surroundings or um, things like training to be stronger. Uh, one of the most new and promising ways that we could have to actually um, create, you know, X-Men-like abilities in the future is something that I work on in my research called genome editing. And I don't do the practical part of it, um, but what I do is look at the ethics, look about, look at questions about whether or not we should be um, making these changes. So genome editing is where we take our own building blocks, our own DNA, our blueprint for our bodies, and we can actually kind of chop into that DNA um, with new genetic tools that we have these days. Um, and we can replace parts of our DNA um, with changed, changed sequences so that our whole blueprint is different. Now, the science isn't quite there yet for some of the more um, out there or radical changes that you might feel like you would want to make to your genome. Um, but as we get better knowledge of what this blueprint, what our DNA actually is, and the effects that cutting and pasting little bits and pieces have, we're going to quite soon have the ability to um, crazy new uh, abilities, these enhancements, uh, and you can have them all the way from birth. So I look specifically at making changes to um, before babies are born, when they're still embryos, so that when they're born, they could have, say, maybe enhanced memory if we could find out um, more specifically which genes in the genome we would have to change to give, um, to give humans better maybe ability to retrieve long-term memory when we're learning so we could learn faster. Or maybe super strength, what helps us to develop muscle fast in our genome and how could we change the levels of that development so that we're all super strong? Now, as I said, some of this is sci-fi a little bit still, but some of it, you know, we've got to start asking these questions, not only about what we can do, but about what we should do in the future before we actually get there and are faced with the question of, is this scientist going to do this, um, this change? So 
the thought experiment that I have for you today looks a little bit at that. Um, so I want you to imagine that in, say, a couple of decades' time, you decide with your partner that you want to become a parent. And just a few years ago, there was this new gene tool that came on the market. And um, the gene tool that it's likely to be in the future, well, that is already being used in similar ways, is called CRISPR-Cas9. Some of you might have heard about it already. And this allows us to, as I said, copy and or cut and paste into our genomes and change the way that we work. <clears throat> So let's say that this is now available in the future. And if you ask your doctor or if you ask someone in healthcare, they will let you go in and say, OK, I want you to take um, some of my genetic material and use it to make a baby. So we might take some eggs and some sperm, put them together in a dish and then test out what the um, genome, what the DNA is of the fertilized um, of the fertilized zygote or embryo. So when we do that, we could make a change. And let's say that you love boxing and what you really, really want is a child who also loves boxing and not only loves it, but is really, really good at it. So in order to make that happen, you might want your child to have super strength. So maybe you can go to your doctor and say, hey, doc, I really want my future child to have super strength. And they say, okay, we have this great CRISPR-Cas9 tool. Um, here it is. We're going to make this happen for you. And then the child is born and they're super strong and they might be really good at boxing. So this is the kind of situation that I want you to think about, not in terms of whether it might be possible, but in terms of what we should do in that situation. So the first question I want to ask you, and please do reply in the chat function, is, is this a good reason to you to make this kind of gene edit to your future child? Is your love of boxing as a parent a good reason to make a super strong child? So I'll give you a minute to think about that and we'll see what you come up with in the chat. Just why, um, why everyone's having a think about that. I think it's also, um, luck would have it, uh, worth mentioning that today the CRISPR gene editing uh, technology that you've mentioned there, Tess, of course, was awarded the Chemistry Nobel Prize uh, today. Yeah, it's very it's, exciting. Uh, it just shows how soon all of this could really be a reality. The technology is essentially there. We just need a bit more of the research knowledge till we're having to really answer these questions. Yeah. Great. I think, okay. there's a, I think there's a general feeling amongst the, <laughs> the replies that I'm seeing. Definitely. I think we have um, a lot of responses in the negative here. So a lot of you are saying that you have some concerns with this, and that's great. We definitely want to think about the ethical concerns there. Some people are saying, no, it's our imperfections. I can see here a great response. Um, our child wouldn't be human if they didn't have any imperfections. So just because you can make this change doesn't mean that you should. And I think that highlights like maybe that should come into a parent's reasoning, a parent's decision making around this just because our child isn't super strong or just because they might not be able to be as good at boxing as we would like them to. Maybe, maybe that's not a good reason when we think about how humid it is to be imperfect. That's really good. Um, I think that some other highlights here. Maybe we, we also... could, sorry, sorry to interrupt, Tess. Mm. Maybe we could, um, I'm just conscious of time. Perhaps yes. you could pick up on some of those comments uh, during the discussion. So if anyone has any sort of questions based around the responses, then, then we can sort of pick those back up. Because I'm really excited for this quiz that I want to get onto. And of course, we want to make sure that we can put everyone's questions Definitely. Uh, that sounds good. Forward, I'm looking uh, forward to talking about them more later. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Tess. Uh, right. So as, as promised, as hinted at, here is a, uh, a very short quiz. Um, so we're going to do an absolute whistle stop tour through this quiz. So we're going to ask you some questions about some animals. And basically, you're going to get about 10 seconds to do each one. So first thing that comes into your head, that's your answer. And that's probably the best way to play this quiz as well. Right. So question one, which of these is the deadliest animal on Earth? to humans? Is it the mosquito, the hippo, the rattlesnake, or crocodile? 
So either note your answer down or stick it in the chat. Right, and that's it. That's all the time we're getting. Question two. <laughs> Which of these animals cannot, repeat, cannot change color? Is it the chameleon, the stoat, the octopus, or the rainbow lorikeet? So again, uh, write your answers uh, in the chat or note them down on your paper. We will be giving you the answers at the end of the broadcast, so you can you can check and see how you did uh, later on. Right, question three. Which of these animals has the longest memory? Uh, this was a good one. So which of these animals has the longest memory? Is it the elephant, the bottlenose dolphin, the chimpanzee, or the eagle owl? So elephant, bottlenose dolphin, chimpanzee, or eagle owl, which one has the longest memory? Okay, two more questions. Number four, what superpower do these animals share? So we have a zebrafish, we have a deer, we have a starfish, and we have a Mexican salamander. And your possible answers are, do they all have amazing hearing? Do they have incredible strength? Can they all repair parts of their bodies? Or do they have excellent night vision? Which of those four superpowers can be seen in the zebrafish, the deer, the starfish, and the Mexican salamander? And now our final question, which of these sea creatures can make themselves invisible? Which of these creatures can make themselves invisible? Is it the jellyfish, the shrimp, or sardines? So that's going to be our final question. So again, I'm going to sort of apologize that it was done really quickly, but the best way to answer is just to write down the first thing that comes into your head in all honesty, uh, and I'll reveal the answers uh, at the end of the broadcast. Um, so that does bring us on now to our panel discussion. So I can see there's been lots of questions um, coming in uh, from everybody. So thank you so much. I'm just going to scroll down and find some of these um, that jump out at me. So I think seeing as, um, Beth, we started with you. So there's a question here because I really liked your fact about ears. So we've got Jack and Zara from Stockwood Park. Hello, Jack and Zara. Uh, they have asked, what do you mean by spiders having ears on their legs and how do the ears on their legs function? That's a great question. So obviously with human ears, which we most think about an ear, we detect vibration in the air with our ears. So spiders, in fact, have hundreds of hairs, which they detect a vibration in the air. So it will catch the air currents and the hairs will vibrate. So they have them distributed across their legs. But they also have um, the ability to detect vibrations that come through the silk. So it comes through the web into their foot and then it's detected by basically very small little slits that they have in their exoskeleton. So that covering over their legs. So they have these two types of sensors so that they can detect vibrations through the air or vibrations through the ground. And that's what I mean by an ear. So an ability to detect these vibrations. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it, when you first mentioned it, I was literally picturing like a thousand little ears sort of yes. look like <laughs> human ones growing on their legs. Which, of course, as you've explained, it's not how, you know, what they would look like. It's more, it's the detection of vibration. Um, brilliant. Thank you very much, Beth. Uh, and thank you again, Jack and Zara, for the question. Um, so we've got another one. I think this one's for you, Juan. Um, so this has come in from um, Evelyn. Evelyn, Evelyn at Denmark Road High School. Uh, and this question is, if humans are able to multitask, how come we weren't able to see the bear? Yeah, so that's a good question. So uh, it's interesting because our attentional resources, we use them for different things uh, in, in different sort of tasks, depending on whether we need to pay attention or not. So when we are starting to learn something that we haven't done before, and it might be a bit difficult to do, I, I don't know, maybe you're too young to learn how to drive, but maybe learn to cycle or something. So at the beginning, when you are just starting to do something, you really need to pay attention to everything you're doing. You really need to think of every little step, right? But once you kind of like learn that, and that sort of becomes really automated in your brain, you can sort of like then uh, 
don't you don't need to use that many attentional resources to do that. And then you can use the remaining attentional resources to do something else. So now you can cycle and you can chat with your friends at the same time. Probably shouldn't do it. You should pay attention to the road. <laughs> but <laughs> yes, there is a li- yes, we can multitask, but there is still a limit of how many things we can do in the same time. And there's always a cost. So it, 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 we also have we, we, we have this sort of like attentional resources and, you know, there's a limit to that. And we, it depends on how many tasks we are trying to do at the same time. That means that if our full attention is not into one of these tasks, then we're not going to probably perform as good as we could. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Um, I know I'm particularly not great at multitasking. So <laughs> I, I did think that when, when the, uh, in your question, uh, Evelyn, when you said uh, if humans are able to multitask, I think that's true for some uh, more so than others, at least from my own experience. <laughs> um, but thank you very much for the question. Thank you, Juan, for the answer. Um, one, I think uh, for you here, Tess, um, do you think editing the way human brains work could have larger impacts or consequences on the way humans function emotionally? Oh, I think that's a great one. Um, and I'm sure probably Juan will have something to add on that too. But in terms of um, thinking about how changing our brains could also change our emotions, yeah, that's a really big concern. There are so many different effects that making one little change can have. Like. Um, I was thinking the other day in my research about memory changes and if we could get people to have enhanced memory, like, wouldn't that be fantastic? But at the same time, there's this question of, okay, what if you couldn't forget anything? Like, does that create trauma? How do you feel about not being able to forget something that you might not actually, might not be a memory that you want to keep? So I think that, yeah, there are some big ethical questions to ask there about What are the side effects that we might not even think of, even when the gene editing itself goes fine, but when there are side effects to just having that kind of change, the way that every superhero has their limitations? Yeah. Um, Juan, did did you have anything to add? I'll just add that, for instance, there's uh, so not only with emotions, but uh, just an example that we actually find cases in which something we call this Aban syndrome. And there are cases in which there are humans that, that, you know, have this, you know, amazing skills that are way above average. But like Tess was saying, it also comes at a cost. So again, this idea that we, we our brain tries to work efficiently. One of our superpowers, so, so to speak, is precisely our flexibility. Our, our brain is very malleable and it changes and it learns and forget things. And that forgetting is just to allow to allow us to have more space to learn something new so we can adapt to different circumstances and different environments. So I, I think, yeah, so th- that's a good point what, what, what Tess was talking about. And, and in this advanced syndrome, like I said, you know, you, you might have these amazing skills, but it might, you know, also come up with some, some limitations for other things that you also would, would need to do in order to, you know, work in, in a... Absolutely. I think there's there's a lot more work. The general feeling I get is there's a lot more work to be done in terms of understanding how you think you're changing one thing, but you don't. We don't yet know how that affects changing other things, which I guess is why your work, for example, tests on the ethics behind this all is is so important to think about. Um, right. So we've got one here now from uh, I've lost my place. Luston, there it is. Luston School uh, have asked. I think this could be one for everybody. In fact. Um, does the idea of superpowers change over time as everyday things for us wouldn't be useful for people in the past? So I think this is kind of saying that, you know, let's say, for example, the fact that today we can do all this amazing stuff with computers. If you took that back to, let's say, the Middle Ages, you would be seen as almost a superhero. That You had this incredible device that allowed you to have all of these abilities. So does anyone want to sort of perhaps touch a little bit on on how our perception of superpowers might change or has changed. So, yeah, I was thinking in terms of if you think about spiders as an example. So they've been around for 380 million years. So and they haven't been the same the whole time. So thinking about natural selection and evolution, you're going to get continuous change. Uh, And it's all to do with what is best at that particular time. So absolutely, I would expect there to be change over time. And it's all to do with um, what we call these selection pressures. So basically what gives the maximum amount of benefit. Uh, But it would be different for different animals, but humans are also 
subject to a certain extent uh, to natural selection and evolution as well. Yeah, if I could um, just build on that too, I think we often don't even realize how things um, like even basic education can be considered an enhancement or um, something that has become so normal um, or the way that education has changed. Like, you know, you didn't need to be able to do, do math like super long, uh, super ages ago, but, you know, the way that we or you might have had to do it in a very different way. You can see the way that what we need changes and that's something that you that we might need to consider for the future too. Maybe the changes that we would see as being useful now and that we might think, oh, okay, there could be great benefit to that. We should really implement that change. We should make sure that people have this enhancement or x -men ability. Um, that might not even be useful in a few generations' time and where these things will affect not just one person but all of their children as well. You've to think about those long-term effects. Yeah. Yeah, I'll just add to that. I mean, if we think about it, like some of the strongest animals that have existed in, in the history uh, of the earth are, were dinosaurs and they became extinct, so they couldn't adapt well. So I saw some comments talking about like perfections and perfections. And, you know, sometimes these imperfections, like, like Tess was saying, over time become some, the, the actual thing that makes you adapt better to that environment. Yeah. No, we, we've got to be careful. <laughs> Again, it's sort of the message here exactly. uh, about all of these things. Awesome. Thank you, Juan. Uh, thank you, everybody, in fact. So unfortunately, we are actually coming towards the end of the session. So just to make sure I get these in, um, I've obviously got to say thank you very much to, to all of our wonderful panel. I will be coming back to you for concluding remarks right at the end. But again, I just want to say thank you and, and give you a round of applause from my end. And if everyone else wants to give a round of applause in their school and, and watching at home, that would be fab. Um, and um, the thank you for everyone sending in your questions. Sorry we didn't get to go through many. There were literally hundreds of questions popping up in my in the chat box. Um, so we will, of course, be reading through them all, and we will select the most thought-provoking question uh, and send you a prize. That one will be announced uh, soon on social media. So do even if now you have a question, keep sending it in because you can still win the prize until the end of this particular uh, broadcast. Um, and of course. If you found this discussion interesting and enjoyed this chat, then do check out all of the other big questions uh, on the Oxplore website, oxplore.org. It's all completely free and very fun, uh, I think, though I may be slightly biased. Um, so the answer to the quiz, as promised. OK, so the first one asks us about deadliest animals. Uh, so the answer is the mosquito. So very well done for anyone who spotted this. I actually knew this one because I had this in a board game I was playing recently, and that was the question. Uh, so the mosquito is the deadliest animal on Earth to humans through their transmission of dangerous diseases such as malaria and Zika, which affect, affects thousands of people every year. So whilst the, you know, you're, you're thinking the snake sort of bites people and poisons them, it's the mosquito transmission of disease that makes them the most deadly to humans. OK, question two, the rainbow lorikeet cannot change colour. So all of the animals can. Chameleons and octopi can make rapid colour changes to camouflage themselves, reflect their mood, or signal they are ready to mate. Now, stoats, which I think was the red herring uh, in this question, so they actually shed their fur to match their surroundings as the seasons change. So they are a rich brown color in the summer, and they are snow white in winter. So it's not quite a rapid change, but they are able to, to change color. Uh, question three, so bottlenose dolphins are thought to have the longest memories. Uh, we're research showing that they can identify the calls of former companions after 20 years of separation. So elephants and chimpanzees are also thought to have good memories, but the research here is limited. So I guess at the moment with our knowledge, we think it's dolphins, but I think most of them there actually had very good memories. Uh, question four, all of the animals can repair themselves. Uh, from limbs to organs. So different, some of them will regrow limbs and some will repair organs in their bodies. So uh, in particular, um, here at Oxford, we've been studying the zebrafish uh, and the fact that they are actually able to regenerate their own heart cells. And the hope is that by understanding this, we can maybe use this for uh, sort of patients who've suffered from uh, heart problems. And finally, question five, uh, sardines have special crystals on their scales that enable them to reflect sunlight and create the optical illusion that they are invisible, which is used to escape predators. 
So some types of shrimp can make themselves invisible, but not the red shrimp. Again, a little bit of a red herring to make that one uh, a little bit trickier. So again, thanks for taking part in the quiz. Thank you for sending in all of your questions. I'm going to give the panel about 20 each to give us their final thoughts on the big question. Uh, can there be real life X-Men? And we'll go to you, Beth, first. So I think we can develop uh, technology as tools to help us have X-Men-like powers. Perfect. <laughs> I give me excited to wrap it as well. Juan, what's your thoughts on our big question? Uh, so I, I think it depends how we define superpowers. Uh, but yeah, I, I agree with that. We can use technology. We can do different things to enhance the things that we... So that's kind of like our superpower. We can learn and develop technology to overcome any limitations that we have. <clears throat> Perfect. And Tess, final thoughts? Yes, I think we definitely can. I think it's not as far into the future as we might often assume. Um, and the question... Uh, is just as much whether we should as what we can do, what we should do if we can. Yeah. Brilliant. That's leads me to say thank you again to all of our panel. Thank you, everyone, uh, for joining in. Uh, check out Oxford.org, and we will be back soon uh, with another live stream. Bye-bye. <laughs>